Hello. Today we are moving on to magnetism, moving away from electricity to magnetism, but eventually we'll combine both of them together again um, in a few weeks or actually next week. So we are going to talk about magnets, we're going to talk about magnetic fields, and we're going to talk about some applications of magnetism in our world. When you think about magnetic fields, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is a magnet. Here is a bar magnet. When you sprinkle iron filings around a bar magnet, those iron filings trace, trace out the shape of the magnetic field or the magnetic field lines around a bar magnet. And we will play with tracing magnetic fields in lab. What is magnetism? We've already talked about the electric field. The electric field has monopoles, electric monopoles. Monopole, mono means singular. Those monopoles are singular positive charges or singular negative charges. There is no such thing as a magnetic monopole. So you can have electric monopoles, which are individual charges, but you can't have singular quanta of magnetic, of magnetism essentially, like you can with um, electric fields. All magnetic fields arise from moving charges in some way. You have moving electric charges, which create magnetic fields. You can also create magnetic fields from movement in the presence of an electric charge. If you have electric charge and you move something conducting within that presence, you can create a magnetic field. So electricity and magnetism are intertwined. Um, when I was an undergrad and when I was in grad school, I had courses called E and M, electricity and magnetism. So whenever you get to higher levels of physics, you cannot separate the electric fields from the magnetic fields. We have to treat them together. And just like electric fields, magnetic fields are invisible, but we can see how particles move in the presence of the magnetic field. Here is a computer simulation of our Earth's magnetic field. So our Earth's magnetic field, you can think of as being like the magnetic field that comes from a bar magnet that has a North Pole and a South Pole. So here we have the interior of the Earth that's creating the Earth's magnetic field in the motion of the uh, Earth's interior, um, liquid metallic interior. And then that motion of that conducting fluid inside the Earth generates an electric field and then as a byproduct generates this magnetic field that protects us. I've got the sun behind me. We can see some of the magnetic fields coming off of the sun's surface here too in these sort of magnetic magnetic loops here. <laughs> um, so that's something that's really important to me, the sun's magnetism, because that's what I studied for my PhD. Um, field, a magnetic field, an electric field, a gravitational field, a field is a way of mapping forces that surround any object that can act on another object at a distance. So just like electric fields, magnetic field lines are useful to visualize the strength and direction of the magnetic field. Now, the direction of magnetic field lines is defined to be the direction in which the north end of a compass needle points. Um, and the magnetic field is traditionally called the B field. So when we perform calculations using the magnetic field, we'll use the capital letter B to represent the magnitude of the magnetic field. Okay. So um, here we have a bar magnet and it's got a north pole end and a south pole end. A compass actually is going to point in a line along and point to the south pole end of a magnetic region. So here we have our um, bar magnet. The compass is actually going to point with its arrow toward the south pole end of the bar magnet. And the arrow of the compass is going to point away from the north pole end of the bar magnet. So you can take compasses and line them up all the way around um, a bar magnet and you can move those compasses and you can tra trace out the direction of the magnetic field around magnets. And we're going to be doing that a little bit in lab too. So a compass actually points toward a south magnetic pole. 
and that points away from a north magnetic pole. So the SI unit for magnetic field is called the Tesla, capital T. So SI, that's our standard unit that we're going to be using in this physics course. The Tesla is named for Nikola Tesla. And Gauss, the other unit of magnetic field, is named for another guy whose last name was Gauss. Gauss is buried in Göttingen, Germany, and I got to visit his grave. Um, we'll see later that Gauss and Weber, another guy whose last name was Weber, they both worked on um, electricity and magnetism, and they both have a unit named after them. And as far as I know, I'm not related to that Weber, the unit of magnetic flux. But he is German, and my family is German as well. So on the North Pole of a bar magnet points towards the Earth's North geographic pole. So when people first started to experiment and play around with magnetic items, they realized that if they took a little piece, a little magnetic piece, and they kind of suspended it in air, that one point, one side of that would always point toward north on the Earth, okay, it would point toward north geographic pole of the Earth. So they called that part of the magnet the North Pole of the magnet because it always pointed toward our North geographic pole. So if this is our magnet here. Imagine that this is a compass. We have a little magnet inside there. The North end of that little compass magnet in there is going to point toward the North geographic pole. But just like um, electric charges, opposite charges attract and like charges repel. So opposite signs of magnetism, the North Pole and the South Pole will attract, and like signs of magnetism will repel. The North Pole will repel the North Pole of a magnet. So what was happening in this little compass, the North Pole end of that compass was pointing toward geographic North, but it was attracted to the Earth's global magnetic field. And at the North Pole of the Earth, you can imagine that there's a big magnet, big bar magnet representing the magnetic field of the Earth inside it. And at the North Pole of the Earth, we actually have that bar magnet oriented such that it's the South magnetic pole that's pointing up. So it's the North Pole of the compass magnet that's being attracted to the South Pole end of the Earth's overall magnetic field. And that south pole end of the Earth's overall magnetic field is pointing toward geographic north. Okay, so that's why we really give the magnets a north pole and a south pole. The north pole end is the north seeking end of the magnet, and the south pole end is the south seeking part of the magnet. So, Earth's magnetic field, and similarly, the magnetic field from a bar magnet is called a dipolar field. Dipolar because there's two poles. There's a north pole end and a south pole end. Um, the magnetic field for the Earth, the magnetic field line vector, is going to be pointing out and away from the south pole, south geographic pole. It's going to arch around and then it's come back around. It's going to point in towards the Earth's um, north pole, which is actually its magnetic south pole. Now, when we draw magnetic field lines, there are four rules. The direction of the magnetic field is always tangent to the field line. That means it lies along the field line at any point in space. A small direction will, a small compass will point in the direction of the field line. So if we take our compass, it will align with the direction of the magnetic field. And that magnetic field always points away from north magnetic poles and toward south magnetic poles. The strength of the magnetic field is proportional to the closeness of those field lines, kind of like our electric fields. And it is exactly proportional to the number of lines per unit area perpendicular to those field lines. The magnetic field lines can never cross, just like our electric field lines. So that means that the magnetic field is unique at any point in space. And magnetic field lines are continuous. They form closed loop without beginning 
or end. They come out of North Poles, they come around and into South Poles, but that loop has to connect back in on itself. And there's no way you can separate a North magnetic pole from a South magnetic pole. If you take a bar magnet that has a North magnetic pole and a South magnetic pole and you chop it in half, now you have two magnets, each now with a new South and North magnetic pole. And you keep on chopping it and chopping it and chopping it and chopping it. And you keep on creating more magnets, each with a North and South pole. And you can keep on doing that until you reach the fundamental constituent particles that that bar magnet was made up of. What are magnets anyway? And I was inspired by our memes, uh, meme discussion to put a little meme in here about magnets because they do appear to be magic. Materials that have or can have a natural magnetism are called ferromagnetic. The source of this name is Fe, ferrum, which is the most common magnetic material. So ferrum is iron, it's kind of the Latin name. All electrons have a property called spin, which gives rise to the magnetism of magnetic materials. So the electrons, as they're orbiting around the nucleus, they can spin like a top by themselves, and then they're orbiting around the nucleus while they do that. And you know, these electrons, they have a charge, they have a negative charge. And this, you know, moving charge generates a what we call a magnetic moment, but it kind of generates its own little magnetic field. Usually the electrons are arranged in a material such that the magnetic moments of the electrons will cancel each other out. But sometimes overall of the whole material, the magnetic moments might not cancel and you could get and you could get them that material to be magnetic. Or if you use something like an additional strong magnetic field brought close to that material, you can align the magnetic moments of the electrons and then you can generate a magnet. You can create a magnet as well. So a magnet is just a, a metallic you know, object that can have a magnetic field, that has a magnetic field of its own. Here's just an example of what I was talking about here. Here's our electron and it's spinning kind of like a top and it's orbiting around the nucleus here. So it has something called an angular momentum. We talked about angular momentum last semester. It's got its own angular momentum and then it has something called the magnetic moment. And all those magnetic moments together can contribute to a magnetic field of a magnet. Now, um, ferromagnetic materials, that's essentially like a metallic material, naturally organize themselves into small magnetic subdomains that are randomly oriented. So here we have kind of a, a metallic material um, that could become a good ma a magnet itself. And within here, we have these domains that are randomly oriented such that they themselves have a North Pole and a South Pole, but they're randomly oriented such that the overall magnetic field of this material is zero or very small, okay? And then you can apply an external magnetic field to cause these subdomains to line up with their magnetism. And then overall, if the majority of those magnetic subdomains are aligned in the same way, you can create a magnet. So heating the ferromagnetic material slightly can help with this process, but beyond a certain temperature, which we call the Curie temperature, and actually this should have one R, not two, the magnet becomes disorganized and it's no longer magnetic. So some materials have Curie temperatures that are below room temperature. So they have to be super cooled in order for them to be a magnet. But iron's Curie temperature is more than 1000 Kelvin. So that temperature is well above room temperature. Below this Curie temperature then it's possible for you to have iron materials and create a magnet out of them.